So uh, it's a pleasure to have Professor Kenneth Hima from Washington University in Seattle here. He's one of the main uh, authors and one of the main figures in legal positivism today. And uh, Professor Hima, I'd like first of all to ask you, uh, since your name is very closely connected to this, what has been called legal conceptual analysis. How would you define conceptual legal analysis? Con conceptual legal, uh, legal uh, conceptual analysis is just the uh, analysis of a concept. And when we analyze, uh, analyze a concept, what we're looking to do is identify the nature of the thing of which a concept is a concept. So the idea here is to identify those properties that are essential to the thing uh, that the concept term refers to. So in the case of law, what we're trying to do is we're trying to discover the nature of law, and we do this by identifying those properties that something has to have, an institutional system of norms has to have in order to, to count as a system of law. So, and, and asking this, I'd like to know, many authors have been very critical of the idea of conceptual analysis. I think that Brian Leiter wrote an article that said, no, no, it's not Brian, Dennis Patterson, farewell to conceptual analysis. So it has been under pressure by many legal theorists. Uh, I'd like to know what is your opinion? What's the future for conceptual analysis? Is it like many authors say, time to move forward? Or what, what, what is the place of conceptual legal analysis? Well, to, to be perfectly frank, I, I find the view a very strange one because, well, when we do this kind of legal theory, what we're doing is legal philosophy, and conceptual analysis is everywhere in philosophy. And you don't hear people arguing in other areas of philosophy that, that there should be an end to conceptual analysis. There might be disagreements about methodology, although those disagreements about methodology are primarily limited to legal philosophy. Um, I ended, Brian Leiter's position on conceptual analysis is derived from Quine's article, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, which Leiter believes, and Quine believed, killed conceptual analysis. But as far as the world of philosophy in general is concerned, conceptual analysis continues, continues um, just as it did before Quine. Um, there was a poll that was done by a number of philosophers. Um, I don't recall, I, I think David Chalmers might have been one, but I'm not, mis, I might be mistaken, that shows, for example, that uh, 73 to 75% of philosophers in general, and we're not talking just about the legal philosophy community, um, accepts, continues to accept the distinction between uh, the analytic and the synthetic. So as far as the rest of the of philosophy goes, is concerned, conceptual analysis continues to be an important part of the project of various areas of philosophy, in particular metaphysics. It goes on in the philosophy of mind. We have to answer the question, for example, what is a mind uh, before, before we can figure out how mind works and how to explain consciousness. Um, when it comes to moral, uh, moral philosophy, we have to give an analysis of the concept of free will. What is free will? To the extent that moral responsibility is conditional on whether or not we have to, have, whether or not human beings have free will, we have to know exactly what free will is. So the point of conceptual analysis is to get clear on the concepts of things, so that we can ask other more, I think, more important questions uh, about those things. Conceptual analysis is important not because it has a lot of substantive implications in the case of law for what the law should be but simply because in order to talk precisely about the law, we need to know exactly what law is. So I, I'm not particularly sympathetic to the idea that conceptual analysis is obsolete, or, and it's certainly not impossible. Um, and that's a view that I find um, articulated far more commonly in legal theory than in, in philosophy at large. And let me ask you, what, what is, in your opinion, the current uh, agenda in legal theory. What I mean, what is because there has been some phases, even in the last decades, there ha has been some emphasis on some issues. And what is, according to your view, what is uh, at stake now? What is the cutting edge uh, dominion of legal theory now? 
Well, I guess it depends on what you think legal theory is. Um, personally, I think, the, I think the far more important questions concern the justification of, of law and the just, justification of legal content. So the most important questions are largely normative. Um, and I view, I view the term legal theory as being broad enough to encompass those particular questions. So as far as what, I mean, if, if the question about what the agenda is, is a question about what the priorities of legal theory should be, my answer would be that it ought to be focusing on what the law should be and not so much on um, what law is by nature. Now, don't get me wrong, I think conceptual analysis of law is a very important, is a very important question, but I think that we don't need to get precisely clear on the concept of law in order to ask the questions about, the normative questions about law that really matter. You know, how should the law treat intellectual property? We don't need a precise analysis of either intellectual property or the law or even morality in order to answer that question. Our pre-theoretic understandings of all the various notions are sufficient for us to answer those questions. Nonetheless, I, I, I think the conceptual analysis should continue regardless of its practical value or its practical implications simply because it's of, it's of intrinsic interest and because of the intellectual challenge. Conceptual analysis tends to be more abstract than other normative questions in that uh, there's something really beautiful about that as far as I'm concerned. The more abstract the, the, the philosophical question, the more intricate and difficult the answers and quite frankly I think that there's something of tremendous value to that. But as far as the agenda of legal theory is concerned, if, if what we mean by that is arranging priorities, I don't think I would put conceptual analysis on the top of the list. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, my own work on, in, in most of my own work in legal theory is, well, to be honest, useless from a practical point of view. Nonetheless, it's fun to do. And, you know, if, if you're interested in those kinds of questions, I hope that my work is fun to read. So that, that, that your answer maybe has made my next question useless as well because I, I think that, uh, well, Ronald working in the beginning of Law's Empire, he says that uh, legal theory is a kind of silent prologue to any theory of adjudication. So would you agree with this statement? Um, well, you know, let's, let's take Dworkin's theory, because Dworkin's theory is very interesting, one, because of the, the methodology. Dworkin adopts an interpretive methodology which is normative and very different from the descriptive methodology that I think is the appropriate one for conceptual analysis. So Dworkin wants to, you know, one of Dworkin's problems with um, legal positivism is he thinks that because positivism adopts a, a descriptive methodology that it gets a purely, you get a purely descriptive theory of the concept of law that is pre-interpretive and hence incomplete. What you need is an interpretive concept that is normatively loaded. All right, fair enough. But if you look at Dworkin's theory, just looking at Dworkin's theory alone isn't going to tell you anything about what the right answers, the morally right answers are to the normative substantive questions of what the law should be that actually matter. There's no way you're going to just look at what Dworkin did in Law's Empire and get an answer to the question, how should intellectual property be? Um, how should intellectual property be protected or whether it should be protected or law? Or how, uh, what punishments are just? There's nothing in there that will actually give you the answer to those questions. Dworkin has opinions about them and he argues for them, but it, it's not, they don't, uh, they don't emerge from his theory of the concept of law. Now, as for the question of the role of adjudication in, in conceptual analysis, um, because your, your question contained two parts, Dworkin takes adjudication as central, um, the, the paradigm uh, example that grounds the conceptual theory of law. Um, a, as a positivist, I see no reason to, to think that's the case. To assume that adjudication is, is foundational is to ignore that to ignore the fact that the, the, the probably the most common source of law uh, is legislature, is the legislature. And I don't think that it's particularly productive to take as your focal point and your primary, your primary foundation for an analysis of the concept of law, 
adjudication because legislation, if it's not more, imp more important, it's equally important. As well, and there are other questions that are equally important with respect to the enforcement of law. So my disagreements with Dworkin, and I'm not necessarily, I'm not suggesting I'm necessarily right, I'm just some other guy who happens to write on the same issues, but I think that methodologically it's problematic to treat adjudication as if it exhausts the paradigms for making law. And, and the reason for that is, well, it's obvious we have other agencies for doing so, like Congress, the executive branch, um, and so I think the appropriate, the appropriate starting point is as far as identifying what we would consider pre-theoretically as paradigms of sources for law, adjudication is one of them, but you can't ignore the legislative, le legislative function, and, not, and, it, and I'm not even saying that the legislative function and the adjudicative function have to be performed separately. Um, uh, I, I was um, at a conference organized recent, uh, last week by Tom, uh, Tom, Thomas Bustamante, and I talked to a number of students who wanted to argue against judicial supremacy. And they were essentially taking the position with respect to constitutional question that the legislature should not only handle the legislative function, um, but also the adjudicative function with respect to making determinations of constitutionality. So my point isn't that, they, that the, the legislative function and the adjudicative function have to be treated separately. It's rather that you've got to take each function into account if you're going to produce a, a, a conceptual theory of law that's well balanced and adequately accounts for all the parad paradigmatic functions that people perform or officials perform in a legal system. Okay, well, thank you very much again. I hope that uh, Getulio Vargas Law School have the privilege to have you again here. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, I, I, I would like to, to thank the law school for the privilege of appearing here. It was a, it was a, it's an honor and I had a wonderful time engaging with people um, and so I'm extremely grateful as well. Thank you. Thank you.